Congratulations. Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. And today we start with a song by Michael Gordon Shapiro from his mini musical The Charmed Life. Congratulations, you just won a brand new pair of shoes. Congratulations, you just won a brand new set of drapes. Congratulations, you just won a carton of shampoo. And an iPod. And a raffle. And a year's supply of grapes. Congratulations, your recent parking ticket was erased. Congratulations, your jury duty summons was recalled. Congratulations, your cat came back. He wouldn't stay away. And, and your neighbors with the loud and hyperactive kids who trample your petunias on their way to school are moving to Nepal. I have always been lucky. Incredibly lucky, ineffably lucky, incessantly lucky. I wish it would stop. Congratulations! I always get the best seats in the house. Congratulations! I win a raffle every other week. Congratulations! I've never had a termite or a mouse or parking ticket or an audit or a single plumbing leak. Congratulations! I haven't bought a magazine in years. Congratulations! My house is filled with things I get for free. And to be completely honest, though I know I should be grateful, the entire situation's made me somewhat jittery. Excuse me? Hey, what are you doing? Installing your new satellite television. 750 channels, including one just about gazebos. I didn't order satellite television. Says here you did. Well, I didn't, so you'll have to go tell your people there's been a mistake. Lady, we get paid by the hour. We're not going anywhere until your undeserved satellite TV is installed. Think of it as a happy little accident. Congratulations! I never sweep the rug and yet it's clean. Congratulations! I never feed my fish but they're alive. Congratulations! I know my luck can't keep up this routine and I keep waiting for some horrible misfortune to arrive. Congratulations! I know this crazy karma cannot last. Congratulations! I know my happy days will have to stop. Everything is balanced, something tragic's in the making and I'm going crazy waiting for the other shoe to drop. Hello and welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits. And if you don't believe me, I'll send you a copy of my birth certificate. Well, you've just heard a piece of music from a mini-musical. It's called The Charmed Life, and it's by American composer and lyricist Michael Gordon Shapiro. Now, Michael is actually an incredibly versatile composer and lyricist, as we'll hear shortly. And in today's episode, you'll hear a conversation I recorded with him at the Royal Festival Hall here in London when he was recently visiting, which took place just after I'd seen three of his mini-musicals, that sort of 10 to 15 minute musicals with three or four songs in them, at the Landor Theatre in South London. Now, mini-musicals seem to be very much something that's creeping up in the world of musical theatre. Certainly here in Britain, in the last, I should say, five years, they seem to be becoming more and more popular. There's a radio programme about them called the 15 Minute Musical, which features, believe it or not, 15 minute mini-musicals, usually about political matters, but they're also turning up in theatres. And as I say, I recently saw a smorgasbord of mini-musicals and songs from shows, of which Michael Gordon Shapiro's work was well represented. But Michael has also scored films and indeed video games. So he's a man who knows his way around the musical landscape. And so it's no surprise that he's finally alighted, amongst other things, on writing musical theatre. Throughout this programme you'll hear a few songs which he's very kindly let us play and I think you'll see that they really do represent an incredibly versatile approach to writing songs. And to make that point, before we go into the interview with Michael, let's hear two songs. The first from a mini-musical called HMS Headwind and those of you who are savvy will survey the Savoy in its workings. Oh, I enjoyed that sentence. And just to contrast with that, immediately afterwards, we'll hear a song from Sidekick, the musical. Very, very different in tone. Both very excellent. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Musical Talk with Michael Gordon Shapiro. Musical Talk. The hands of fortune will never fall on, on Englishmen, English on English seas, as one endeavouring to uphold the interests of His Majesty. With trim mid topsails and hauled lines from London to Botany Bay, we follow the foamy brine. The Commodore leading the way. Yes, yes, our Commodore, Commodore leading the way. I am the compass of noble souls. An Englishman on English seas. A central figure of starry roles in future naval histories. So fire the cannons and aim them too, and revel till anchor's away. We travel the ocean blue. 
octopus, duty's a cargo, and death is a feather, and home is a tower of canvas and leather, so never the tether, there's sea burning weather today! Always left behind Always stuck on the sidelines Just a guard When things get tough When things get hard I'm told to step aside I guess I understand I'm just a sidekick After all Not very daring, smart or tall Nobody who could turn the tide but what I wouldn't give to be Asked to come along, asked to lend a hand Allowed to risk a fall, allowed to take a stand If they just let me try, they'd see But I guess there's no point In wondering what I'd do If I were a he There's no point. It's just conjecture. So I won't think about it. I would race through the night, patrolling each city and street, ever diligent, ever vigilant, nothing escaping my view. I'd perform mighty feats, rescuing damsels and battling jerks. It'd be part of a good day's work if I were a hero too. Some might not know my name, but I'd defend them just the same Cause it's right, and it's good, and the comic books strongly imply that I should And those who shake in fear, will shake no more when I am here I mean there, I'll figure this out, and when I do evil had better beware And that's just the start of all that I'd do if I were a hero when all seemed calm and peaceful, I'd walk among the people of the kingdom, concealed by my secret identity. Oh, hi, Inky. Hi there, Mr. Smith. What are you up to today? Oh, nothing, just tending the garden. You? Just enjoying a walk, not leading the fight against evil in any way. <laughs> hi, Inky. Hello, Mrs. Applebaum. I saw smoke rising from your basement yesterday. You wouldn't happen to be constructing a superphotonic modulatory energy condenser for use in laying siege to villainous fortresses, would you? Uh... No? Oh, my mistake. Have a nice day, sweetie. <sighs> that was close. I'd battle goblin hordes and evil ghouls with evil wards. I would shine. I'd take a stand against litter and cutting in line. I'd keep watch on the skies, knowing that evil never lies. I mean, lies down. It lies all the time, but that's why I'd be around. And when I was fully grown, I'd have a sidekick of my own And he'd Never be left behind Never stuck on the sidelines As a guard When things get tough When they get hard I will keep him close at hand In a team Side by side That's exactly what I'll do when I am a hero to Man, I really need to pee. Musical talk. Hi, I'm Michael Gordon Shapiro. I'm a composer whose work includes film scores and scores for video games, and more recently, my career musical theater. Uh, I've written a number of short 10 to 15 minute musicals, some of which were recently featured in a festival called Bite Size. I'm sorry, it was a showcase called Bite Size at a larger festival called From Page to Stage, which I believe you saw a few weeks ago. I did indeed, down at the Landor in South London. And I want to talk about both your work in relation to mini musicals and indeed your thoughts about how mini musicals, for want of a better phrase for them, what they give the world. But I think it's fair to say that um, musical theatre is just one string to the uh, 
your violin of talents, if I may say. <laughs> now, you mentioned briefly that you've done film music as well. So tell us, first of all, how did you get into composing? I got into composing because after a very sensible four-year degree in cognitive science, I realized that music was my calling and it was time to throw away all that expensive education. (laughs) And I sat down and tried to solve the problem of how one makes a career in music rather than an extended hobby. And I thought through the various ways one can do musical composition. And I thought I've always loved film scores. And I found there was a place you could go to study how to do film scores uh, at the time that was University of Southern California. And I applied to that, and to my shock, I was accepted, and I went through an excellent education. And from there, I started my path doing film and television and later video game music. And you you actually got a fairly high-profile film score fairly on in your career, I rather think. Did you not? Well, it depends how you define high-profile. Well, something that went somewhere. I might say it depends how you define somewhere, but I did a couple (laughs) of... I did a couple of independent theatrical features, some of which found theatrical release. The one you're most likely to have seen from my early career is called Homeroom, which was a drama that was about the aftermath of a school shooting that was itself released in the aftermath of several school shootings. So it had some unfortunate timeliness, but that had Victor Garber and Eric Christensen and a couple of recognizable actors. And there have been some films subsequently that were more or less recognizable, and Very recently, I had the pleasure of writing some music for Birdemic 2, which (laughs) just had its London premiere, and I guess European premiere, just yesterday. Oh, really? You're absolutely the man of the moment, then, if I may say. A very short moment, yes. But you you write film music, and you also then touched upon the fact that you write game music. Um, This is for computer games. Indeed. Was that something that you'd always envisaged would be part of film music? Because in some senses, there's overlap with that. That was something I desperately tried to avoid for a long time. And it wasn't out of lack of love for video games, which I've played since I was a child, but in the earlier days... You must finish it by now. What's that? You must have finished one of them by now. A few, (laughs) but embarrassingly few. The, The early days of game music had a kind of stigma. It wasn't treated very seriously. The technology didn't let you write very high quality music. It was all infamous synthesizer beeps and boops. And I thought that if I did that, I would be trapped in a hallway of of low tech music and unrecognizability. But as things have turned out, game music has converged with film music. They do live orchestral recordings Mm -hmm. for game music that are every bit as lavish as what John Williams does. So uh, I found it's a very natural place to go. And I've enjoyed doing that as well as the more traditional linear scores for film. So this is really because they have sort of merged into similar, if not the same, concepts. As you say, there's a world of difference between the man who came up with the jingle for Tetris, based, as it is, I believe, on a Russian folk song anyway, right. and writing a, a proper score for a interactive form, which is essentially what games have become, in a way. Or am I grossly oversimplifying it? It has been known. <laughs> That's not an unfair generalisation. Game music and film music are similar, but in some ways distinct in that film music is very specific to a particular story, whereas game music, you're scoring a continuity and you possibly aren't aware of the specific details of gameplay when you're writing the music. So you're more likely to be writing music for a scene of carnage without knowing exactly when an arrow is going to fatally transfix your hero's (laughs) head, whereas in a film you spend a lot of time working out the timing so the exact moment that arrow plunges through the helmet, that's when you have the timpani roll or whatever you decide to do. Oh, right, so it's, it's ambient atmosphere in some senses rather than specific um, incident. Ambience implies peace to me. And oh, in does a it? way, that's sometimes the case. Yes. Uh, sometimes you have to be very clever in writing something that has thematic qualities while not being too predictable and not looping in a way that a player would easily hear because you may spend dozens of hours with a game and if you start to recognize where the same melody starts and stops, you'll become resentful and you'll turn off the music and the rest of the game will be unaccompanied. That's very interesting, of course, yes, because the other thing is you'll never quite know how long a sitting uh, of playing a game is likely to take, whereas obviously you know your film is going to be 2 hours and 11 minutes or however long the, however many feet of uh, film, if they still use it that way, uh, actually is. Uh, I'm not using footage in feet and inches anymore, but the, the spirit of your comment is correct. <laughs> in, in, in my world, everyone still does. Well, when I started, we were actually looking at these uh, arcane click books that had everything in terms of fa- feet and frames, and you had to do horrible math to figure out how your timings are going to work out. But fortunately, I, I started working just at the sunset of that sad era. But, well, let's move on a little from that, because, uh, I mean, th- forgive me, these, as I say, are... Um Preludes. Preludes to our main yeah, topic. They're, 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 they're other aspects of your career. And, but what it, I think it does show is your versatility. But like so many people, you have found your way to musical theatre. Was that always in the background, or is it something that you stumbled across? Uh, as you say, games were really what you were planning to do. How did musical theatre land, <laughs> land in your purview? 
if any of my game clients are listening, I just want to say that I love working for you. Please continue to engage my services. I don't listen to this man. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I had a love for musical theater since childhood. When I was a kid, I musically imprinted on The Beatles, the score for Jesus Christ Superstar, and Tom Lehrer. And <laughs> I think those three canonical influences describe my personality musically and in real life. So I'm essentially a smartass who loves romantic melodies. And I... I listened to a lot of musical cast recordings and my parents would drag me out to Broadway. I was completely unappreciative of it, but they'd say, you're going to go see these mm -hmm. shows and I'd go and be influenced and, uh, profoundly. But I didn't really do anything about my desire to write for theater for, for many years. And I was involved in a couple of abortive projects in my 20s and I tried, to, tried my hand at doing a full-length show and none of those efforts really went anywhere. And after a couple of those false starts, I asked myself, well, why? and concluded that writing musicals is difficult. <laughs> and more so, people who try there to write many musicals... many people who haven't realized that, by the way, so that, well, still, that makes you already more knowledgeable than many. It took me a long time to come to that conclusion, and I think you're actually, though you said that semi-jokingly, there's an important insight there, and that many people who try to write musicals are, are not as good as they think they are, and the results are not as promising, and there's often a very extended effort to what turns out to be a disappointing result. And I, I kind of went down that path with a couple of projects that were well intended, but I simply didn't have the technique or, or knowledge to really do a good job. So I said to myself, well, people learn how to do things that are difficult all the time. We have surgeons and space pilots. But I, I, I reasoned myself, there's got to be a way to get better at this without throwing yourself into a two-year project that fades away. So I, I thought, well, how would people do this if they were learning an academic environment? And they would probably do exercises, and they'd do small projects, and iterate through the process of conceiving a show, writing it, rewriting it, and importantly, seeing it performed and getting that form of feedback. And students would do that many times over a short period, rather than do one project over two or three years, during which time morale will sink to the bottom of the floor and nothing will really be learned. So I came up with the idea for myself of trying my hand at very short musicals, 10 to 15 minutes. And that was the start of a sequence that I would write over the next few years. Now, I've got to ask you, certainly in Britain, there has, I would say in the last three years, been a sort of trend towards mini musicals. I mean, nobody thought about them, and if they were being performed, they weren't being widely spotted. And yet, on BBC Radio 4, um, we, have, uh, we have had over the last few years a series of mini musicals. Um, as you say, uh, you're... Uh, have, uh, three of yours have been shown, shown, listen to me, three of them have been performed, thank you, at the Landor Theatre only recently, um, and there are other ones out there. Is this a, were you aware of other people doing it when you started, or did you just, as you say, came, came to it from a position of, this will teach me something and I'll learn from it? Um, or did you say, I'm going to be a trendsetter? <laughs> I was peripherally aware of the existence of 10-minute play festivals, and had been at a few, and I reasoned that a few might be amenable to accepting musical submissions. So after I had written my first uh, 10 minute musicals, which in practice are 12 to 15, but I like to call them 10 minutes to get them past the submission committee, <laughs> uh, I would send a letter of inquiry and say, would you be open to accepting a musical submission? You don't need musicians, I've got pre-recorded tracks, you just need a vocalist. Eventually I learned it's best not to ask and simply to send it, and with a little disclaimer saying if you'd like to perform this, you'll need at least you know, end vocalists, and I will email you some MP3 files, and you can play those. And to my pleasant surprise, I found a few that said yes. And I, I should take a step back and say that after I'd written most of my shows, I would self-produce at a local mm -hmm. play festival in North Hollywood at the Secret Rose Theater, and I would use that as a uh, forge to hammer out all the weaknesses and see what the strengths were in the show and revise. And Nothing beats seeing it with an audience. Absolutely. The things that I thought were hysterical turned out to be absolutely flat, and jokes that I thought of at the last minute and would throw in there got the best response. So it was humbling and educating at the same time. But I, I did find that some 10-minute play festivals were amenable to musical submissions, and they might have some musical actors in their ensembles. A few are of the you-show-it-up-and-produce-it variety, oh, uh, do-it-yourself. And eventually I found there were a couple of festivals that were dedicated to short musicals. There is and there was and possibly still is one in Australia called Short, Sweet and Song, 
which is a offshoot of their main 10-minute play festival, which is short and sweet. And uh, I discovered them by Googling by accident and submitted over two years two different miniature shows, and both of them were performed there. Oh, good. So it was, it was very exciting discovering that there was an actual, I don't want to say market, but performance <laughs> opportunities existed for this strange subgenre of a strange subgenre. <laughs> That's nicely put. Would you say that, I mean, I have to ask you, bearing in mind there, there is this little community of writers, well, is it fair to call the people who write mini musicals a community? Do you know any of your fellow mini musical writers, or are you individuals who meet, if you meet at all, at these festivals and then move on? And How much collaboration, I don't mean in creating work, but you know, do you say, should we move... I'm not putting this at all well, but I'm no, trying, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to ask if you're, um, yes, if you you know each other and you're, you recognize yourself as a movement. Or are we lone wolves staring yeah. jealously at one another from the towers yes. of our castle? Uh, prior to starting to write these kind of projects, I didn't really know anyone else who was doing it. And if I mentioned what I was writing, I would get a strange look. Yeah. I'd say, why, why such a short show? And it was embarrassing to the reason, so I would just say it was a genre I wanted to explore. Uh, as time went on, I would try to drag my colleagues into what we'll call a community. I would yes. approach some of my fellow composers who I knew for other reasons. i say, this is a great way to toss off an idea quickly and see it performed with far less stress and cost. And in some cases, I was successful. Uh, fellow composers who I've convinced to submit to the same festivals and have had their works performed. So I'm trying to synthesize a community yes. in one way. And I've had some correspondence with other people who've been involved. I think it's such a strange art form that there is a sense of kinship with anyone else who's willing to do it. Which then begs the question, forgive me, if you sort of got into it because it was a, a self-training exercise, and yet at the same level it's also a sub-genre, as you quite rightly pointed out, you know, it, it can only share some of the characteristics of a, shall we say, for want of a better phrase, a full two-act, uh, hour-and-a-half, two-hour musical, then... Are there, what are the lessons that you can draw from it? You know, could you ever extrapolate the lessons you've learned from this to make a longer musical? Because I know you have written longer musicals, and you've been off Broadway as well. I, I have, yes. uh, in the form of the New York French Festival. There, since I approached it as a training exercise that accidentally turned out to have artistic meaning to me, at least. Yes. Uh, I would, I would definitely say there's a lot to learn from the microforms that you can apply to larger forms. What it really does is give you discipline and brevity and focus. Because in a 10 to 15 minute show, there are no throwaway songs. No. <laughs> Every song has to have multiple functions. And there's even, I wouldn't call it a formula, but a archetype that I found myself returning to for practical reasons. And that would be, you have your first song, which might be all of two minutes during which you introduce the world and the principal characters and maybe hint at the conflicts to come. Your foundation song. Exactly. Uh, subsequent to that, I found that there'd be a second song of approximately equal duration that would introduce your first plot twist, at which point you would then have some kind of conflict resolution and a third song that would either embody the climax or perhaps the resolution right after the climax. And I learned how to write in essentials. I learned how to say, what does the song have to say in a very, 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 very clear way uh, and I drew those lessons with me as I later went on to write my first one act, uh, which was a children's show. Mm. Uh, I, I took lessons of brevity and focus and clarity and knowing what a song's about rather than sitting down and saying, well, this character is going to whinge a little bit. This is the super sidekick, is it? It is. Yes. Well, we'll touch upon that in a little bit. Sure. Um, but I still, I, forgive me, I'd like to explore more the mini musical, because as I say, it's, it is, it's the newest trend in musical theatre that I've spotted. Uh, apart from failure in the West End, because on the day as we recall this, uh, um, Viva Forever has just announced its closing. I'm sorry, that must be a blow, because I know how much you like the Spice Girls. <laughs> I have read about them in the books. Um, there are a lot of people who are unhappy, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who didn't give a damn, let's be honest. So I think that may be the problem there, but that's a discussion for another day. But back to the mini musical. Um, do you write your own book? In most cases, I do. When I started out, uh, in the spirit of self-education, I wanted to keep things very simple, and I teamed up with another playwright, one who had done a little bit of work in musical theater, was primarily was a straight playwright, uh, a fellow named Mark Levine, who is, I, I think he's the king of 10-minute straight plays, at least in the United States. And if you look at any 10-minute play festival, his name will typically be there one or two times. So he was a real veteran of the form, sans music and we ran into each other online and we put our heads together and came up with a what for me was the first complete performed short musical 
and working with another writer was very useful because it let me focus on just one aspect of the production. But subsequent to that, I figured, okay, I've, I've kind of kept standing my own feet at this point, and I plunged into doing book music and lyrics, which, again, if your show is 15 minutes long, is not a yeah, huge undertaking. Exactly right. So for that very first one, you, as you say, you worked with a collaborator, and it allowed you to concentrate on writing the score and the lyrics, but you presumably were therefore also able to learn the mechanistic points that one needs to learn for book writing. Indeed. To allow you to write books later on, but had you ever sort of envisaged yourself writing books for musicals of any length in the past? Because a lot of people would run at that, or from that perhaps, might be better. <laughs> I think the answer to that also describes how I've matured as a composer for theatre because in my very early days I thought that the book was this platform that served as a surface for my wonderful music. <laughs> and subsequently it became clear to me that the story and, and the book elements were crucial to the show and that sometimes I, I found myself thinking first of the story and then deciding what kind of music would support it, mm. which was almost treason to my original intentions as a composer. So and it's yet probably a better way forward, I might have guessed. I, I agree completely. Yes. I, I find songwriting much easier than book writing at this point, and lyrics for sure, which is a very slow process for me. But being able to have my hand in all of them gives me a certain amount of freedom. I can gut part of the story at 3 a.m. with two weeks to go without offending anyone except yes. my own pride. I'm also interested in, I mean, the three I saw were remarkably different. I mean, obviously, one would want them to be. It's, if it's going to be a showcase, you, you don't want them to all seem the same. Um, there was the... I want to get, make sure I get the, the name right here. HMS Wind... HMS Headwind. Headwind, thank exactly. you. I, tell, I keep wanting to say HMS uh, Windrush, which, of course... Well, the Windrush is the famous ship that, um, in this country, um, began the wave of immigration from the colonies in the 1950s. Hmm. Um, but the HMS Headwind... Um, was a, 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 a Victorian British um, naval boat and a, and a love story with pirates in 15 minutes, I think is the fairest way of describing that, or would you care to... Uh, well, that's a good way of putting it. Um, and then there was another splendid one, which was a kind of sort of guardian angel story, although they were real life people, people who looked after other people, who then in turn were looked after by other people. And that had all the hallmarks of a, if not quite a science fiction story, certainly a sort of a, a roll doll story with a twist of a tail. That was The Charmed Life? Yes. I wouldn't have thought of that as a Roald Dahl story just because it's more benevolent. The universe in which it is set is more benevolent. Well, yeah, yes, although, forgive me, um, how shall I put it? I think there's an element of creepiness in it. I mean, I'm not sure I would like the fact that there was somebody watching over my shoulder who I wasn't aware of fixing my plumbing for me. Bearing in mind I just had electricians in. Um, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to have done it when I wasn't there, let's put it that way. You're very sensitive to the issue. What's, <laughs> what's interesting about that that show, and I'll recap it very briefly for the benefit of your mm -hmm. audience, which is about a woman who thinks she has incredible luck, and ha that's followed her her entire life. Almost resents it, doesn't she? She's become a bit freaked out by it. She keeps, uh, her parking tickets are dismissed magically. She, as she puts it at one point, she never feeds her fish, but they're somehow alive, and everything seems to be going her way, and she infers that she is in for some kind, she has a gambler's fallacy. She thinks that some whopper of bad luck is, is heading for her, and it turns out the cause of her good luck is a, you might say, a benevolent stalker, a man who fell in <laughs> love with her many years ago and has been secretly creeping around and making things go right for her, including sneaking into her house at certain times of day when he knows she's at work and adjusting her plumbing and cleaning her carpet and so on. This was the one uh, whose book was written by Mark Levine. This was uh, his idea. And it, she discovers him, and the, the, the conflict is, what do you do about someone who's in love with you but who has subordinated their entire life to helping yours? What I found about this particular show is that the interpretation by the actors can dramatically impact how it's perceived. The stalker, uh, and pronouncing that with quotes, can be portrayed as a very benevolent person who's just very sweet and his song is very sweet and he's a uh, loving guy who just didn't know how to, I guess, in a non-dysfunctional, exactly, he was, had a strange way of expressing himself. Or it can be played as a stalker. Some is very creepy and uh, unsettling, and I'm, I haven't seen the production that you have, and I'm inferring that perhaps this was the perhaps the latter interpretation. I don't think it was done creepily. I just think the concept. I mean, it was a very strong concept, and I found it creepy myself. Um, I, I have no reason to believe that the the character being portrayed was anything other than well-meaning. Um, but you could still do terrible things in the name of love, and this appeared to be that to me. But. Um, 
we didn't murder anybody. Just, just fixed her plumbing. It's not that <laughs> awful. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. Although I, 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 it's the, um, it's the secret that you're not aware of, sudden, uh, and the sudden revelation thereof. I think is the part that I would find curious if it was me in those circumstances. But here we are. Look, we're talking about the, the actual book, which is very interesting. HMS um, Headwind. Headwind, thank you very much. You, you read my mind. Um, actually, you read it, although it was blank, so you kind of filled it. Um, Inception. It's very, very different, and it almost. Now, you can tell me, obviously, one sees the, 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 the three letters HMS, and one immediately thinks of HMS Pinafore, and you immediately think British um, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Um, and there were some archetypes, I thought, were being mined to, order to, allow, uh, to allow that to happen without it being in any way... A direct. It was more of a lampoon rather than a satire. Just the way I saw it. Right. Would you say there was anything that, or was it just that actually, by chance, you chose to set it on a, a British naval ship? No, it is not a coincidence that embodies most of the cliches of the Savoy operettas. Yes. I am a, a big GNS fan. And what an excellent man you are! I, I can tell the quality as you arrived. Well, well I, I, I figure if if you saw it as falling in that genre, then I've I've hit home in terms of my intent because it was supposed to be a, a love letter to Gilbert and Sullivan, a, a tribute, maybe gently teasing, but not a parody, not not something that was denigrating the source material, and I tried to avoid parodying any particular GNS show, despite the similarity of the title, but I said it on a frigates and there's a pompous well-meaning but incompetent captain and there's certain archetypes and there's a a transformation of the pirates in Penzance song where they're loudly booming about their stealth and I yes. did yeah. some a sort of variation of that and a ludicrous ending with a utterly predictable family relationship at the end so yes. I, I was this was part of my trying my hand in different styles and I thought why not do a short Gilbert and Sullivan operetta Edda and that's <laughs> the origin of that. And would you say that, in your experience, people have been spotting it for what it is? Without, without a doubt. It's, it's they did where honest. I was, if I was at the, the night I saw it. Uh, I enjoyed that one a, a very great deal as well, partly because I enjoyed the, um, for want of a better phrase, the GNS flavours. Um, but it was such a contrast from the, the, the luck story. But I have, having seen your three mini musicals and having heard other ones on the radio, um, there's a, 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 it's actually called the 15 minute musical on BBC Radio 4 hmm. and they generally those ones are faintly satirical um, to a less or greater degree of success I must say sometimes they're a little bit broad in their um, approach uh, and don't stand up so, wouldn't you know forgive me your stories will I think could be performed in 10 years 20 years 30 years and still not have lost any of their purpose where I think the ones on the radio are aimed at something particular satire particularly political satire, which of course um, is stale the next morning, let alone uh, yeah, you know, four hours after the performance. So, but having had some experience of listening to mini musicals in different spheres and contexts, the question I've always thought is, where's the integrated score? Now you, you need to now convince me, if you don't mind me saying, why the score is and can be integrated in three or four songs. Just you don't have to do anything of the kind. I'm, I'm, I'm merely suggesting you might like to. This, by the way, was my nightmare in anticipation of this interview, is that you were going to throw at me some incredibly erudite comment, and I wouldn't be able to run off for two hours to formulate a response, and I'd have to improvise something. But by an integrated score, you mean one that simply the story is of the, the story is conveyed through the songs rather than the songs being extraneous or... Well, uh, let me bluntly describe how I understand um, in, in integrated scores because you remember I'm, I'm not music is my first thing I'm much I'm much more comfortable with words and, and music is something I very much enjoy but the mechanics etc um, I accept at a much more basic level than, the, than than a quality professional such as yourself I may say but an integrated score it seems to me um, is when you can tell that all the songs in uh, a score are clearly from the same pen um, but there are recurring themes which are used in different ways it's almost variations upon a, 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 a um, some several themes which are then uh, interlocked and um, <laughs> infinitely varied, that's the hope. I mean, and the simple way of doing it, of course, is taking the, um, the tune you use for a verse and then later on using it in a chorus for a totally different song. And everyone says, oh, this seems familiar. I mean, that's a very simple and basic way of doing it, although it's a very traditional way of doing it. But sometimes it really needs the tapestry of a large number of songs in a score to allow you to take a little bit from that song, a little bit from this song, and then fuse them together in a third song. Obviously, you only need three songs for that. I've just identified that. So that could be an easy, quick win answer for you. But I wondered if you're... I, th I think you can also tell me why an integrated score is actually a subtly different thing, and I'm, I'm really working in the kindergarten of uh, understanding. 
I'm glad I prompted you for elaboration. So just <laughs> yes, 15 minutes later, I'm sorry. No, it's not just because it was fascinating, because the, the term has a slightly different connotation than how I've heard it used. So you oh. mean it in the sense, almost a uh, Wagnerian leitmotif sense, where musical themes are recurring and returning to us, possibly transformed, and the music is rather than a set of songs that each one of which could have been written. Well, like, I'm dressed as a Valkyrie yeah. as we speak, so yes, I think I must be, I must be, I think that's how I understand it. If you think it's actually something else, I'm really interested to hear what you think just generally about. So, you know, do, do throw away your comments well, into the mix. Through my uh, very patchwork education in the history of musical theatre, I've heard the term mean songs that are tightly bound to the storytelling, where if you were to remove the songs, the show would fall apart and be incomprehensible. As opposed to the tradition, you know, the, the, what was it, the Black Thief, the very first uh, credited musical theater production where they just dropped the songs in, or something, isn't it? something yes. along that yes. area. But, but I can certainly answer your question. Um, when your show is 12 to 15 minutes long and you've got maybe six minutes of music, there is a fine line between recurring themes and repeating a song in its yeah. entirety. There are some, and different composers will give you a different answer to this question, I found there are few opportunities to bring back thematic material, uh, melodies and, and lyrics that I've used before. And in one case, uh, in Climb the Smallest Mountain, which was my short musical about a miniature golf tournament, uh, yes. the Played final... The utmost seriousness, if I may say. It, it absolutely was. It, the, the last musical, the last song, the songlet, in five seconds, is really a recap of the triumphant anthem of the hero who we stayed at the beginning. In, in Charmed Life, the story about the benevolent stalker the final songlet, again a five second little reprise, it's literally a reprise of a hook from the opening song, which now has new meaning as it's directed to new character. So I've tried stunts oh. like that. Hmm. I, I can elaborate that for the audience if you think it'd be interesting. But. I, I'm already interested, so yes, please carry on. Well, in Charmed Life, the opening song is called Congratulations, and it is essentially a what you might call a, an ensemble number for a show that has a small cast, where the heroine, who is cursed with good luck, is being bombarded on all sides by congratulations. Yes. Everyone in the world is uh, celebrating the fact that she just won free cable television or that her parking tickets were just dismissed and so forth, and she is, has her hands to her ears and is kind of fleeing home, escaping the the yes. attack of congratulations. At the end of the show, and this constitutes a spoiler, the heroine, Margie, has confronted her benevolent stalker, has decided that though there are certain conveniences from having a life partner who will fix her plumbing without provocation, she really <laughs> needed to create her own life unassisted, and she has turned down his, his, his love, returned his love. He, in turn, in the little O. Henry-esque twist at the end, discovers that he himself has a kind of meta-stalker, someone who's been observing him, uh, and became infatuated with him in seeing how dedicated he was to another woman. So his own schemes have been ed aided by someone who is in love with him, and he finds that he himself now is the subject of the same strange attention that he was bestowing under the heroine, and the chorus turns to him and says congratulations in the exact same way they had turned and said congratulations to Margie at the beginning. So it's, I, I tried to turn it on its head and provide a little recap to the beginning and some continuity. So whether that falls under the category of an integrated score in the sense you meant, I'm not entirely sure. Well, I'd like to thank you anyway for helping to at least differentiate two kinds of integrated score, because you're right, I was, look, I was talking about it as being sort of um, musically holistic, not necessarily its connection with the... Um, not necessarily its hermetic collection, uh, connection with the, 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 the plot and the book. Um, and you have helpfully explained that obviously through this use of reprise, and also, if I may say, the, um, the second meaning of the lyrics in a new context, right. actually. Uh, and let's not forget that songs are words as well as music. You know, they have to be both. Of course. Well, I, I, I state the obvious, but, but the number of people who think one is more important than the other... Um, Give or take. Yes. <laughs> when we talk about a musically integrated score, the integration comes from both the music and the lyrics in this case. Um, have you ever, however, considered whether there is, and I appreciate you, you I mean, you, you, put, you hit the nail right on the head when you said the difficulty is to avoid repetition, particularly when you've only got three or four songs. Um, is there a way of finding a <laughs> difference and similarity in a series of songs? Now, there's a ridiculous question, but it doesn't mean I don't demand an answer. <laughs> Could you elaborate a little bit? Yes, I think I might have to, to be honest. Um, now I am actually yes. confused. It's not the sunlight making me squint. <laughs> um, I suppose what I'm trying to say there is, you know, um, you're quite right. The songs need to be different enough to be different songs and not seem samey 
and yet somehow is there a way of drawing from the other songs not just in the reprise at the end if you like um, something from each you know the songs that precede into the next song um, I seem to I could be completely wrong I had a sense and maybe it was through atmosphere rather than through any um, repetition or at least um, parallel with the melody in the um, the Royal Navy one I seem to to me there seemed to be a sense of slightly more cohesion in the cohesion's a better word isn't it um, cohesion in the music or the songs I should say That's but I could be talking bald dash as I said before it's, um, it's very much on the cards there's a lot of stylistic cohesion within each of the short musicals that I've written, and that's because when I set out to, each write, to write each one, I was approaching a particular genre style. In terms of specific melodies and thematic cohesion, I'm not sure there is a lot, and I'm not, that's not to say it can't be done. It just it seems that I've come up with three or 3.5 songs that felt like they're part of the same universe, and stylistically were similar. All of the music in Climb the Smallest Mountain was in a pop rock tradition, and as you said, HMS Hedwin's score was all very much in this late 19th century, early 20th century operetta genre. And there may have unintentionally been more literal repetition in that one. Uh, that, I, I should take that back. In HMS Hedwin, there is a literal reprise. The first and last songs are same melodically. One difference is at the opening, the crew is cheering for English men on English seas, and in the finale, they correct themselves and say English folk because they have, yes. again, a spoiler, they've adopted a, a female crew member, in, in fact, as their new surrogate uh, first mate. So that was a literal repetition, which musically isn't all that exciting, but I think that's an example of what you're talking about, if I understand your meaning. Yes, I, I, think, I think you have actually convinced me, if you don't mind me saying, um, and shed some light on actually something I thought might have been missing from the genre but it seems to me that there are ways of doing it but they are slightly like the genre itself just slightly more the idea has been taken out just twisted a little bit on its axis and put back in um, which I think makes it all the more interesting actually if I may say but let us talk not just of your mini musicals but, uh, but also of your you know, your one act musical uh, Super Sidekick there is a Tell very. Us about that. Sounds, I, I mean, the title itself is a, is a winner. I have to credit the title to Gregory Crafts, who's the book writer in that case. It's a story of a assistant superhero or sidekick who yearns to be a full fledged superhero, but he is stuck working for a somewhat van glamorous and bumbling, vain publicity hound who doesn't actually fight all that much evil. The, the backstory is that the sidekick named Inky is actually the brains behind the operation, but he's very insecure and he doesn't get any credit for what he does. And one day, Blackjack, along with the local princess, is abducted by an evil wizard, leaving Inky alone to try to save the day on his own and thus go through the process of growth and, at the end, perhaps becoming a full-fledged superhero in his own right. <laughs> As you may uh, infer, this is a children's musical or family musical, and it's one hour in duration. And it actually, in terms of my involvement, there is a natural segue from my work in short musicals. And it is as follows. When I was looking for opportunities to have my short musicals performed, I found that there was a yearly short play festival offered by Samuel French, which the, the, the publisher, the publisher yes. who has offices here in London as well as in the US. He does indeed. Well, they do. They do. Yes. I'm I think not sure Mr. French is still around. Is he, he is not. He no. is of the uh, prior century predominantly. Yes. But this was, like many others, an opportunity to stage straight plays, and I sent a letter of inquiry and I asked if they take musicals. and. Either they had done so in the past or they weren't adverse to doing so in the present, but either way the answer was yes. So, uh, I that is a good answer. That was the one I was looking for. And I participated in that in two years. I sent initially Climb the Smallest Mountain, the miniature golf show, and subsequently HMS Headwind. And this was a do-it-yourself production. You had to drum up a director and cast from New York City. And if you're from Los Angeles, that presents a bit of yes. a logistical challenge. There's but a geographical distance, is there not? There is, but I'm from New York and I have family there, so it was a little easier for me than someone else who might not have had that level of connection. And I was in the festival two years. It was a great experience. It was a, if not a stone's throw from Broadway, a, a ballista shot or <laughs> a trebuchet shot away. It was a very exciting place. But I learned afterwards that Samuel French one of their motivations in holding the festival is to scout out for talent. Mm. And I came to know some of the literary departments uh, through my participation in the festivals. And I mentioned offhand that I had been working on a children's musical. And they kind of perked up. Samuel French does a lot of theater for young audiences. 
and Greg and I got our show together and we submitted it. And a mere two years later, we <laughs> well, received. She's not that slow in musical theatre terms. As we found out, yes. two years prior, we had expected a response within a week or two, and we were very excited. But our excitement resumed, and we are now published by Samuel French. And it's all because, uh, in terms of my involvement, all because I started doing these little 10 to 15 minute shows. So I can trace a very direct path to these small labors of love that were not created with any business intent, uh, that were really self-educational in nature, to uh, my first published work. So uh, I hope this is a source of inspiration for any composers in your listenership who might be wondering how to reach a publisher. But working in short form is very practical as well as enjoyable artistically. This is uh, Mighty Oaks from Little Acorns Grove, is it not? Uh, Never heard that expression, but it sounds spot on. <laughs> well, in which case, I shall uh, copyright it immediately and charge everyone uh, a guinea every time they wish to use it. There we are. Indeed. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it has been performed, really, not? Very recently as well. We, we first hit the Samuel French catalogue a few weeks ago. We had been preparing it, and I'd been finalising the scores and uh, the musical end of things. And we just hit their website and their catalogue, I think, a month or two ago. And actually, in advance of our being officially on their catalog, we had our first license just through word of mouth. Yes. So a well, theater that's in delightful, is it not? It was very flattering, yes. very exciting. And a theater in Fairfield, Iowa, licensed our show and performed it in a much larger theater than we had ever performed it. So that was that was a very exciting turn of events. And did, was it well received, both by the performers as well as by the audiences? Would you say? It's so hard to tell with a children's show because everyone loves it no matter what. Yes. But I have reason to believe that sincerely the cast and the, those in attendance had a good time. And it was through sussing out Facebook responses and uh, some of the commentary we received. You say that. I think, you, I think you're diminishing your own worth there because I have to say I find children, when they don't like something, they let it be known. That's true, but they might also be, as we found, vocal during a performance of the show they do like. Children's theatre is intrinsically participatory, whether you intend it or not. Your cast will likely have dialogues with cast with yes. members of the audience who will decide they want to have their say on the turn of events. They unfolding. want in on the action. Exactly. And uh, when we did our initial productions of Super Sidekick, we found that our lead actor was receiving a training in improv theatre because he would always have to field some comment from some three-year-old in the front who says, Mommy, I want to go home. Oh, right. And he learned to say, you and me both, sister, and yeah, yeah, other, yeah. other great responses. So... Uh, be that as it may, we, we've got very good response. We, it's really exciting to see kids enthused about characters who, really Greg, but we introduced to them just a few minutes prior, and it's been strangely fulfilling. And off-Broadway? It's technically yes, because we were in the New York Fringe Festival, and our theater qualified by yeah. the definition of off-Broadway. We I don't remember the theater, and it's very embarrassing. But it was more than, I think, the 99-seat threshold. So it has, it has run so off-Broadway. Well, forgive me. You know, if you don't mind me saying, that's a pretty good badge to have on the old CV. No complaints whatsoever. Musical talk. We'll hear more from Michael in just a minute as we talk about something a bit different. But to give an example of some more of his work, let's hear the villain song from Sidekick the Musical. I think the lyrics in this are fantastic. You might think a man in my position's got it made But conquering a kingdom is a breeze That only shows you're unacquainted with the trials of my trade For the evil life is never filled with ease Perhaps you think it's simple to be villainous and vile That one never has to hone one's bite or bark in truth, I take great pains to get my ill-begotten gains To be sinister is no stock in the park It's hard to be evil It's tough to be mean You don't simply take a tonic and the next day be mnemonic It's a never-ending fight, it's a round-the-clock regime It's work to be wicked or to make one person sad To disrupt the common wheel can be so very difficile And there's precious little guidance to be had It's really rather tricky to be bad Have you ever tried to detonate a train? Well, have you? 
It's not as straight and easy as the stories make it sound. You've got to lay explosives over every inch of ground. And to read the schedule right, or you'll just waste dynamite. Have you ever tried to break into a bank? Didn't think so. If you think it's simply dumb, then you're in for quite a shock. You've got to bribe the guard and spend an hour with the lock. And good luck avoiding harm if someone sets off the alarm. It's hard to be evil. It's tough to be mean. You can't simply read a book and cultivate a threatening look. You'll be tired and afraid. It's as bad as second grade. It's work to be wicked. Complex to be a cat. You'll have to learn to work a flog lest you just be a jerk in progress in an untrained and a hero simply sad. It's really quite exhausting to be bad. Have you ever tried to kidnap someone famous? Well, the process will add ten years to your rage. You'll have to rent a lair and buy a freshener for the cage. And it really gets my goat when I misspell a ransom note and koala suit. Don't get me started. Those Aussies are a constant aggravation. For one thing, they're a giant pain to get past immigration. And how I'd wish they'd shipped us some supplies of eucalyptus. It's hard to be evil. It's far too to be foul. You can't simply grab a mask in some melodramatic cow. You have to cause calamity, or at least a woe is me. It's work to be wicked. It's enough to drive you mad. You think your job is hard, you're never running from the gods And if you've never seen a dungeon, then be glad It's very, very tricky to be bad Try stealing candy from a baby. They bite. How am I supposed to set forest fires when Tinder is so expensive? You try wearing black all the time. I could teach you, but I'd have to charge. All the good slogans are gone. It's very, 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 very tricky to be bad. But it does pay rather nicely. Now, I would like in a minute to sort of touch upon what the future holds for you, Michael. Um, but I think it's now perhaps time to take a slight sideways uh, step because um, you've been very flattering to me um, before the recording and uh, because you amazed me by letting me know that you've, uh, you've listened to some episodes of Musical Talk, um, not least all the way through, which I find is the most stunning and frightening part of the whole process. And as you know, we have, over the course of the last few weeks, stroke months, and I'm sure soon to be years, been having an on-off debate about when did popular music and musical theatre sort of diverge. And you wrote me an interesting email about the whole thing. I just wonder, are you happy to talk a little bit about that? What your view is, because there's no wrong answer. I think there are probably many wrong answers. <laughs> and I've used all those. The young ones left must be good. This is uh, a little like being asked to come to the head of the class and talk to the professor because I, I, I've been awestruck by your erudition and how much you know about the history of musical theater. I just use long words and hope for the best. I will try to emulate that. It's, it's been great hearing these sort of installment revelations on trends in the history of musical theater and my knowledge is not a drop in the ocean of yours, but if you want to set up the context, mm -hmm. I can chime in to, until I feel like I'm sounding foolish. Well, as listeners may know, if they've uh, managed to stomach more than one episode, um, I was pondering a, a good few weeks ago now how, well, it seemed to me that I was struck that the music from the 1950s in particular um, did two things. First of all, it misinterpreted the 1920s very badly, uh, where it, and it raided an awful lot of songs from the 1920s. There was um, a, quite often novelty numbers, which they then misinterpreted and, um, and therefore misunderstood. And also, I was arguing that in the 1950s, just prior to rock and roll, you sort of start to get the beginning of um, heavy beats and rhythms. And, and I don't have the musical training to be able to talk about off beats and things like that, but certainly there were, you know, it's the beginning of the beat generation, shall we say. And so many songs were sort of forced into the straight jacket of a regular beat, and the rhythm, at least, maybe rhythm more than beat at that stage in the 50s became the driving force of the songs. Add to that a misinterpretation of the songs that they were covering, and you have musicals, uh, and you have popular music suddenly veering off 
into a world where meaning is very much less important than it had been, or so it seemed to me. Whereas, of course, in musical theatre, you've always got the demand of driving the narrative, and I think that's actually become more and more of it since, um, dare I say their names in a positive light, Rodgers and Hammerstein. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm bleeding within, if, if that <laughs> says a... Uh, I mean, they obviously did a lot of good for musical theatre, they did a lot of bad as well, in my view, but, you know, certainly when it comes to making books more important and using the other meaning of integrated score that we were talking about earlier, whereas tying the songs to the meaning of the narrative and driving it along, you know, that's true, but they really did innovate on that front. So, if musical theatre has a demand for uh, lyrical sense and meaning, and popular music was driving away from that, then my view is that that's, I think, one of the places where you can see the fork in the road, where a music which could do both suddenly had to make a decision and go in a different direction, or two different directions. That was my essential theory. Um, from there, we've, there have been further discussions about, well, what about specifically written pop musicals? I think my argument has always been a specifically written pop musical. It's never actually really been a pop musical. It's always been a pop style musical, right? Um, or a rock style musical, which is actually just another. You know, it's in the wider stream of musical theatre music. If you can argue there is such a thing, but I think now you can. That's my very long-winded uh, contextualisation, also known in the trade as just repeating myself ad nauseum, which is uh, what we do a lot on the radio. So, <laughs> um, I wondered if you had any thoughts or views. In fact, I know that you do. Well, I'm hard-pressed to recap what I wrote in email, because it was several weeks ago, but I can certainly add a couple of thoughts on the fly. I'm not sure I accept the premise that rhythmically driven music is less meaningful. It may lend itself less to a certain style of expression and maybe even a certain style of story. Uh, rock musicals definitely have a much narrower focus or a narrower emotional atmosphere of which they're well suited to express uh, emotion. but. Unless you you're mean the big brush stuff, love, betrayal, death. Exactly. Well, rock music is kind of intrinsically rebellious, and I've seen it misapplied to stories. They're very rich rebels, aren't they? They do carry on. Well, the good ones are, but <laughs> yes. there, there's a kind, and hip hop as well. There's a kind of uh, rebellion against authority and discontent, and in order to round out the emotional landscape, rock music has traditionally had to expand a little bit, widen the vocabulary. And, and maybe there's something to what you're saying is that it's adopting a, a musical style. I, I remember mentioning there, there have been a number of film musicals where the purpose was to, we talked about one earlier today, was to glorify a given band. And they would start with the, the songs of that band and try to weave a narrative around them. And this is a, long if not rich history going back to you know, Elvis and the Beatles and everything else. Some people have been rich on it but, <laughs> but I think there, there are a number of as someone who grew up listening to Jesus Christ Superstar for example where there is a rhythmic propulsion in the opening in Heaven on Their Minds and a number of songs that I think ties exactly into the mood of that kind of story you know the very tribal visceral kind of storytelling and that interpretation of the Bible, and that worked out very well, and I didn't feel that the richness of the story was compromised by using a rock style. This may be off axis to your point, so feel free to... No, I'm, I'm very interested in that, but my, my counter question, therefore, is... I think Jesus Christ Superstar is an interesting example, because there are a couple of songs that actually got out of that, um, and into the hit parade, if not necessarily um, at the top of the charts. Um, but take Spring Awakening, which has recently been advertised as a rock musical, um, and, you know, and, among people who like musicals, it's been very well received. I mean, it didn't last very long in London, but, um, but you know, it's, it's well remembered and it's regularly revived, particularly by university groups and uh, at Edinburgh, you'll be able to see it and things like that. But can you tell me if any of those songs have really made it into genuinely the public consciousness? Well, it's hard to Are say. Are they genuinely I'm, popular? Uh, I'm, I don't exactly have my finger on the pulse no. of what the kids like today, but it's I know not among the kids. I, I, pop, pop is what's pop, popular, isn't it? There's no centralized authority, though, on, on, I guess, maybe the iTunes charts. I think that among younger audiences who have some exposure to musical theater, uh, the finale at of Spring Awakening, uh, Purple Summer, if I'm remembering, uh, has a lot of appeal. Some of the songs within. That would be Donna Summer's sister, would it? Yes, exactly. Uh, well, I do. This was the example I sent you over email. In the 80s, a song from Chess managed yes. to cross over, which is One Night in Bangkok. And I personally first encountered that song in the context of seeing it on MTV and wondering why it had such an eccentric video and who this Murray Head guy was. So we have a legitimate crossover case, at least there, and I'm sure there must be some others, where a song really did double duty and it wasn't just among theater nerds, it was the, the wider audience. 
I mean, sometimes it works in other ways as well. I mean, um, the chap who wrote The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which uh, came to London last year and was fantastic, I, I, my eyes were open to it, uh, and they remain open. I love it. Um, the chap who wrote that, is it Rupert Holmes, I think is it? Um, he had had several chart successes, at least as a songwriter, in the 1970s and 80s. And if you go onto YouTube, Oh, the thing about Edwin Drood, I don't know how well you know the score, but it's um, absolutely in the... Um, it's, least, it's an attempt at the British music hall tradition. Mm -hmm. Music hall rather than music hall. Um, and it's certainly... But it's certainly and no one will call it a, a series of modern pop songs. I mean, it, there may be the occasional nod in sentiment, but not really in um, any other way. But there's this tremendously fabulous and stroke awful, you know, it can be both things at once, um, video on YouTube where he's taken one of the big numbers from it and turned it into a pop, pop song with the cast. So, um... Successful? Well, not, not to my ears. Not and, I don't believe, and I don't believe it charted, or if it did, it went straight in at number 98, and <laughs> which may have been where it was. Um, but it's, it's, it's an attempt by a successful pop song writer to take a musical, or a song from a musical, which I think isn't trying to be a pop song at all, a pop musical, and then making it into a pop musical, and then failing to do so. I'm not, not sure that takes us very far, except as an anecdote. Um, but I was trying to work out what makes a successful pop musical then. And you're quite right with chess, you know, you've got no better... Um, musical language. Than, well, than the ABBA people, let's be honest, um, and a bit of Tim Rice, you know, there's a lot of success going on there. Uh, so I'm not at all surprised about that. But it seems to me the exception rather than the rule. In terms of a pop musical being successful or a pop, pop influence. Yeah. I think you're right on that. I think those, the people who approach writing a pop or rock musical are divided among talented show writers who are adopting that vocabulary. Yeah. And perhaps to your dismay, I'll include Andrew Lloyd Webber, at least historically. Oh, yeah. and he can't be knocked. He has a lot of talents. He just doesn't always use them. <laughs> um, and the other category of people are, are rock stars who think, oh, I'll just try my hand at this, and suddenly Bono has you know, Spider-Man on, on tap. And uh, so there's, there are fewer people who are devoid of knowledge of musical theater who try to write 1950s-style musical yes. theater. It's a self-selecting population. There's more expertise to begin with. But I think of those who are very talented, you can get artistic results that are comparable to traditional theater, just in a very specific musical vocabulary. And... I don't even rule out the possibility of a well-written hip-hop musical. No. Though I, I don't think I'm familiar with any of the existing ones. I'm kind of dimly aware of a few that came and went. But I think it can be done well, provided you select a story and characters for whom that music language makes sense. And an emotional uh, atmosphere, emotional essence, that also makes sense for that style of music. And for Chess and Jesus Christ Superstar and some others, it does make sense. And there are others that I will not name. Uh, for fear of embarrassing them or myself, where you have a kind of watery halfway pop music yes. that's not really pop music. Pop style. It, not even that. There's right. sort of, a drum machine and a couple of chord progressions that sound like they might have been ripped off the chart, but the spirit isn't there. You know, If yeah. you're doing a rock show, it has to be defiant. It has to have a kind of edge and energy to it, and you're, that has to belong to your story. But I suppose my question, therefore, well, in a way, that, I mean, forgive me, that's a very interesting response, particularly as it takes us a little bit full circle, because it seems to me people saying that, yes, if you've got the right book or the right drive for what you're trying to get across, then certain um, idioms of music will operate. Um, so, as you say, the hip-hop musical would work for the story in which hip-hop operates. Um, which is hard to say, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I don't intend to repeat it, which is why I recorded it for later usage. Um, but in fairness, um, which takes us... I think, back to the point I was trying to make was, but is the music of hip-hop broad enough, not in terms of vocabulary, but in terms of expression, to cover all emotion? Now, it may be, and it, I'm not going to pretend for one second, I know enough about hip-hop to make a valid judgment. So, um, but could, can hip-hop, could you tell Madame Butterfly with hip-hop? And I suspect you couldn't, and I suspect the reason you couldn't is because hip-hop doesn't allow you the breadth of the emotion. Or am I talking nonsense once again? I'm quite happy, by the way, to be told that I am talking nonsense, either by you or by our listeners, because um, that way debate happens. And we can come to the right answer. I I'm so hesitant to make generalizations here because oh, I'm... jump right in. The water's lovely. Come uh, on. 40 year, 41 year old white boy. So uh, <laughs> I'm not smack in the middle of the demographic, but there are two aspects that we could think about. And one is 
the sensitivity of those who listen to hip hop to what we perceive as indiscernible differences, but to them is night and day. Yes, stylistic, yes. stylistic differences between two artists may seem the world to someone who's grown up listening to this kind of music. And to us, it'd be just, oh, there's a beat, there's somebody who's upset, uh, and they're speaking in, in, in their bonics. And, uh, so there's a, for the right audience, we might add that to yeah. the formula. But there's another element is that... By the way, I perfectly, I'm um, very, just to reiterate the fact that I'm utterly ignorant of the genre of music, so um, that I'm sure absolutely true. So I'm not going to pretend for one second that what I said is true. Carry on, please. Fair enough. And I'm, I'm not far behind you, honestly. <laughs> uh, I, I've listened to a few canonical hip-hop artists and a lot of Eminem, and, who is a kind of a bridge artist. But another aspect is that if you look at pop musicals or rock musicals, they often would expand the vocabulary past what you would literally hear on a rock album, or perhaps uh, inclusive of song styles that might be the one eccentric track on the album. There's a, <laughs> this is a strange example, and this is all that's leaping to mind, but there is a Kid Rock song uh, on an album that is otherwise predominated by lots of angry yelling that's more country ballad. And you could say, well, that's not really hip hop. He's just expanding himself into a couple of other genres, and that would eventually come to predominate his career. But once you're working in a musical style, a pop style, there's no there's no law that says every single track has to be dead center representative of how we no, think of the style. There's a range, absolutely. Yeah. So it may be that when hip hop is applied to musical theater, they'll draw from R&B, they'll draw from uh, more ballad-like styles that were contemporary with hip hop. There may be, maybe some will make an integration with the orchestra in some way. Maybe that's happened already. I'm going to move back into more mainstream pop, for one of a phrase, because once again, it doesn't actually appeal to me, and I find it generally quite bland. But obviously, it is, it is a wide range. It's gone on for many years, and it's changed in its style. So it's a very, very broad term I'm using. But I'm still not convinced that, and this may not be the failure of the genre, it may just be the failure of the people who exercise the genre, that I'm not convinced that it covers all the emotional spectrum. I'm just trying to think of a pop song which is about liking somebody rather than loving somebody, or that kind of sort of coyness. Um, I'll give you a good example of old music. There's a, an old song, it used to be sung on the mu musical, which is called uh, Lily of Laguna. And um, once again, it's a good example of a, a song from the 1950s being misunderstood and misrecorded. Bing Crosby recorded it in the 50s. Uh, and he changed, the, the song's actually about, I've met this lady, um, I think she likes me. And it's in that use, it's in, in the use of the word like. Where all the coyness and surprise and delicacy of feeling, and that you know that nervousness that we all feel if we're attracted to somebody and we're not sure or we think we might there's an attraction back, that's you know that's I mean it's it's quite a feat at some level, but that's what the original lyrics say. Bing Crosby records it with I think she loves me, which I think just is, is very much a blunt instrument in comparison and um, loses all the subtlety. And I'm just trying to think of other songs that might have ever touched upon that emotion, let alone any of the others. There are a million other gentle things. Now, I'm not for one second saying that they can't. I just wonder if anyone has ever bothered to write that kind of song in the pop genre. And now people will write to me and send me <laughs> 4,000. Prepare for the influx yes. of email message. Well, just off the top of my head, I thought of the, I think it's the Beach Boys, Something Tells Me I'm Into Something Good, which is uh, not addressed to a second person, but is describing the early onset of love, if you will, the, the early phases where the relationship is just forming and the excitement of that period, you might argue that the musical style doesn't deliver to you, given your emotional associations, that same feeling. But I certainly we, don't get subtlety in that feeling. But. Well, again, it depends on your context. If you're yes. thinking, if you're listening to pop songs of the 50s and 60s, again, it's the slight, it's the, the subtlety of differentiation when you are within an audience for a style. You may regard that as a big difference from California Girls for Dreaming, but that's, yeah, that's a different song. But California Dreaming, and you know, you may say, wow, this is completely different, even though as an outsider to that style, you'd say, well, they all sound the same. Or, um, I'm almost embarrassed to come up with this as an example, but the recent pop hit, Call Me Maybe, uh, characterized by no true rhymes at all, but you know, so, you know the, the the story, if you will, of the lyrics is you know I just met you, and uh, I am sort of flirting with you, and I'm being a little impulsive, and I'm trying to instigate something that is kind of a contemporary equivalent to the song you were describing. That's, no, that's fair. I don't know the song. I'm not going to pretend I do. Um, and I've just thought, in, in you know, in a, in, in a reverse way, I suspect uh, I'm just a teenage dirtbag, for example, is unlikely to have been a, a sentiment often covered in the 1920s. Um, 
but I think you're right, obviously, yes. It's my lack of knowledge of the breadth of what's possible. So I may have to go off and reconsider my position. So thank you. This has been a really helpful conversation. But let's take it back to you, Michael, if I may say, because uh, yours is a name that I'm sure we shall hear more of in the future uh, in both mini musicals and bigger musicals. So but tell us, at least in the world of theatre and musical theatre, what's, uh, what's in store for you and therefore in, for us, I hope? There are a couple of tracks. Even though I started doing short musicals as a self-educational exercise, I still like the form a lot, and I'm going to continue to write more and more as time goes on and to explore different styles. And I just wrote a two-and-a-half-minute musical <laughs> for a 25-play-per-hour festival back in Los Angeles. That was a lot of fun. And 25 plays an hour, hence two-and-a-half minutes. Exactly. Yeah. It, that was tremendously fun, and that was even more of a challenge mm. to compress that much story into such a short space. Uh, Greg Crafts and I, the, we're both the collaborators and super sidekick, are getting our heads together on a couple of other children's family projects that we're going to be developing over the next year or so. And we're both really excited having had such an unexpected success with our first collaboration. And I'm now in some cases ready to return to those abortive projects of my 20s, those uh, full musicals that never went anywhere because I didn't have the technique. And I thought the ideas were all good and there was tremendous yes. potential and now having earned a few scars and a little bit more experience, I feel I can bring them back. I can return to where I started, so I've come full circle in a way. So you've got your inspiration, and now it's time to apply the perspiration as the observation has been made in the past. Exactly so. Splendid. So, but if people want to follow your work, or indeed hear extracts from a few songs, I think, they can go to your website, can they not? They can indeed. Uh, my Are you going to tell them how to make it easy? <laughs> Why, I am. Good. My website is mikemusic.com, just one word, M-I-K-E-M-U-S-I-C. -E you can also find me on Facebook if you search for Michael Gordon Shapiro. I am on Twitter, and I don't remember my handle, so go to one of those <laughs> other places, and you can find all the links to my other social networking avatar identities. Splendid, and I would recommend popping along to the website because, well, it, I think it's, it shows the versatility uh, that you display that we were touching on at the very beginning of this interview. It's not just musical theatre, so if you're interested in games or film music, also you have a lot to say. So it seems to me that um, it's, a, it's a destination of choice for the discerning listener. Would you not agree? I would, actually, I think I will steal that quote and <laughs> quote you in and out of context. So thank you very much. You're very kind. Yes, You're very kind. Michael, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Likewise. Thanks for having me. And that was a conversation with Michael Gordon Shapiro, topped off at the very end with a tiny, tiny little reprise from The Charmed Life that we were talking about earlier on in the conversation. Well, my thanks to Michael. Frankly, he could not have been more generous. He only had limited time here in London. He was visiting. And it was so good of him to spare some of that time to talk to me. I do hope you enjoyed the conversation, and also his thoughts on that matter that we've been discussing on and off on Musical Talk for the last few months, the divergence between popular music and show music. And we'll be discussing that issue again in fuller detail with Tim Saywood in next week's episode. And my thanks to everyone who's written in with comments on that. If you want to see some very interesting conversations, go along to the website called Middle Brown Musicals, a very excellent blog about musical theatre, and the chap who runs that, who's a very sound and intelligent man, has written a very interesting article based on what we've been talking about, putting forward some of his own ideas. But for now, it's time to say goodbye, I think. So, as I said, thank you to Michael Gordon Shapiro for his time, his conversation, his thoughts, and also for allowing us to play some of his music. And we'll finish today with yet another reprise. In this case, the reprise from HMS Headwind, which we touched upon in the conversation, which I think is a fantastic piece of music, very reminiscent of Gilbert and Sullivan, without being Gilbert and Sullivan. It speaks also with its own voice. And so it must be time to say goodbye. Look at the clock. What time does it say? Well, there you are. That is the time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Hands of fortune will never fold On English folk, on English seas As one endeavouring to uphold The interests of his majesty With trim new topsails and hauled with lines From London to Botany Bay We follow the foamy bride Cos duties are cargo and death is a feather And home is a tower of canvas and leather So sever the tether their seafaring weather today This episode of Musical Talk Edited and presented by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2013, except for the music, which is copyrighted to Michael Gordon Shapiro and is played with his permission and with our gratitude. 
And now for some rather Royal Festival Hall special announcement, Out Talks. Had you ever fancied yourself as a book writer beforehand, is what I'm very loosely saying. Not as such. I'm very interested in storytelling. <laughs> May have to <laughs> edit this out. It's the auditorium doors are now open. But one of them anyway. The gritty reality of the podcast world. Everything seems so polished. Oh yeah, up to a point, Lord Copper. Uh, that will occur with um, increasing, increasing frequency, frequency and irritation. So um, we, we just have to remember where we are and hold our tongues. That has flushed my short-term memory clear, so why don't you repose the question oh, and I'll sure. tackle it. At the, and this is going to be a terrible spoiler, so fast forward. <laughs> oh, <laughs> saved by the bell. <laughs> exactly. Please take your seats as the performance begins in five minutes. At least they'll be out of our hair in five minutes. Yes, although the next five minutes might be quite trying, so. <laughs> I will try to make, I'll try to make this editable for you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats in the world. It stops you from cursing. The yes. performance begins in three minutes. Um, no, I forgot where I was. But um, lyrics as oh, yes. songs, and you'd be surprised the number of people who, 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 who subscribe to the idea that one is more important than the other. Um, so it's not. I think the there is a lot of stylistic integration in all the miniatures that I've written because I set out to. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. <laughs> Two minutes, one minute. What do you think? Performance begins in one minute. Oh, right. Should have exactly. How did I start that? Um, I, I pity you for the editing that's to follow. <laughs> get, this there, is the one downside of this place. There is a re- Please take your seats in the Royal Festival Hall. The performance is about to begin. This had better be good. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have the medi- uh, medical, listen to me, I don't have the musical. I'll say that again. I'm not sure I entirely accept the premise that rhythmically driven music. Should we wait this out? No, no, this is fine. Oh, okay. Now that, as far as I'm concerned, if you're happy, is the end of the interview per se. Is there anything you... I'm still recording, so you, this is on the record, but is there anything you want in or out or um, to retweak? To me, it sounded good. I so. don't think I embarrassed myself no. beyond my threshold of willingness to let people hear it, so uh, <laughs> I think that was great. It was a lot of fun. Jolly good. Well, thank you very much indeed. I am now going to turn it off. There is a great humor value in leaving Don't Put This In untouched and letting <laughs> the conversation flow around it. Cause.